Dr. Noah Wells. Dr. Wells yawned before he picked up his coffee cup and finished what his third helping was. Dissatisfied when he realized there was not any more, he looked down the hall from his office towards the break room, knowing that a full pot was more than likely made. Shannon's going to kill me, he said to himself before siding against his better judgment and walked down the hall with his empty cup in hand. His wife had gotten on his case over the past few months about the amount of caffeine he consumes. Not that she was one to talk, but naturally, she expected him to follow her example since she'd started her new diet. Honestly, he tried. But with long shifts and a busy workday, it was not easy to keep his mind focused on his job when the Sandman came knocking. I hope this coffee's hot and fresh, Well said before he walked into the break room, half expecting one or more nurses to be in there. Oh well, more for me, I guess. The pot was filled to the top, but when Wells grabbed it, he was surprised to find the coffee was cold. It had probably been sitting there for the past couple of hours, a carnal sin in a busy hospital with overworked staff who also needed the extra boost to keep them awake and functional. Wells shrugged his shoulders, figuring whoever made it probably had to run off and take care of some emergency. So, he poured himself a cup and stuck it in the microwave before grabbing the creamer out of the refrigerator and a single packet of sugar. As he waited for the timer to reach zero, he turned sharply as he thought he heard something heavy crash onto the floor down the hall. Standing in the doorway, he listened again. There was a loud beeping noise, but that was about it. Is everything okay? He called out. As Wells stepped out of the break room, there was no answer and took a couple steps down the hall, listening carefully. The microwave timer beeped, which startled Wells, causing him to jump as his nerves had gotten the better of him. He turned to go back inside the break room when he heard a high-pitched scream from a woman. Hello? Is everything okay? Wells turned and rushed down the hall, knowing this wasn't the typical scream he was used to hearing from a patient. This was primal, like a person would sound like in a horror movie. As he turned the corner, he saw a nurse attacking a woman who struggled against him, her feet slipping in a pool of blood. Hey! Wells ran forward, stopping in his tracks when he laid eyes on the man that held the woman. Oh my god. Wells covered his mouth, mortified when he saw the male nurse tearing into the woman's throat with his teeth. She, unable to speak. She was still alive, looking over at Wells with teary eyes, begging for him to help without words. Wells grabbed a fire extinguisher that hung on the wall and dashed over to the nurse, bashing the extinguisher against the back of his skull. The nurse turned, letting go of his victim as he stared up at Wells with a face covered with blood. His eyes were yellow, terrifying, and seemed no longer human. Wells struck the nurse again as he lunged at him. The nurse's face split open as a mouthful of teeth spilled across the floor. This did not faze him as the attacker turned and tried to rush Wells again. This time, Wells hit the man harder, knocking the nurse to the ground. He did not stop there, as he continued to bash the fire extinguisher down onto the man's head until his skull caved in and brain spilled out over the floor. Wells breathed heavily as he slipped in the pool of blood, falling against the wall. He then realized the woman was still alive as she lay on the floor, looking up at him, her mouth moving as she tried to say something, but could not. Wells crawled over to her and looked for anything he could use to stop the bleeding, ultimately deciding his lab coat was the best choice. Removing it, he shoved it against the woman's throat, which pulsated with streams of blood that squirted out. Someone help me! Wells tried to lift the woman to her feet. She was too heavy, almost dead weight. He continued to lose his grip and slipped in the blood several times. The woman clutched his collar as she was in shock, struggling to speak before her eyes rolled back into her head and her body convulsing. Wells cried out again, but once more, no one heard him. When he felt the woman go limp, he realized she was dead. Wells covered his mouth, mortified by what happened once he laid her down on the floor. It was then that he heard more screams coming from down the hall. He panicked, hiding behind a workstation as a nurse ran past him. She was covered in blood, and her arm appeared to be mangled. Two men chasing after her, both patients still wearing their hospital gowns. Wells noted the same monstrous appearance in their eyes, as they were more like crazed beasts than men. When he got the nerve, he stood up, ran back to his office, and shut the door before closing the blinds. He reached for his cell phone, which was on the top of his desk, and frantically tried to dial for help. However, there was no signal. Grabbing the landline, Wells dialed again. The phone rang twice before a woman answered. 911, how can I help you? Hello, my name is Noah Wells. 
I am the chief surgeon at Treasure Island Memorial Hospital. Something strange is happening here. The patients and nurses, they've all gone mad murdering each other. Sir? I don't understand, the operator said. Please catch your breath and speak as clearly as you can. They're murdering people! I don't know what's going on or why. You need to send the police here. The SWAT! The army! I don't give a damn! Something very wrong is happening! We have units on the way, sir. I advise you stay where you are as long as you are safe. Don't try- Don't try what? Hello? Hello, are you there? Wells tried to dial again, but this time there was no signal. Another loud crash sounded, followed by frantic screaming. A moment later, he heard gunshots, six in total. Wells crawled under his desk before reaching for a nearby golf club. He crouched down, holding onto his weapon, and waited for the violence to stop. More gunshots echoed down the halls, followed by a feral screaming. There was more running. There was more screaming. After about 30 minutes, the halls were silent once more that Wells decided he could not stay where he was a moment longer. His instincts told him to find a way out of the hospital as he feared one of those things would discover him. Quietly? He moved to his door and unlocked it, slowly opening it and peeking through the crack. He saw a dead body down the hall, another nurse, but he heard nothing else. Wells, with a golf club in hand, moved quickly out of his office. He was on the fourth floor and thought it was best to work his way down instead of up. Slowly, he made his way over to the elevator, but decided against using it. He was unsure if there were any more of those things on this floor that might be close enough to hear it, so instead, he moved into a low crouch over to the stairs. Heading down, Wells heard more fighting and screaming coming from the third floor. A large pool of blood spilled under the access door to this level, indicating that he had to keep going down and dare not venture outside to see what was happening. He stopped, however, when he came across the first set of bodies. At least half a dozen victims were on the floor. Some of them with broken necks clearly trampled when patients and staff rushed down the stairs to escape. As he reached the second floor, he kept going before realizing the stairs leading to the first floor were filled with the dead. He struggled to control his breathing and thought if he should continue down. He hated the thought of having to step over people he knew, as more than a few of the victims were hospital staff he was friends with. Ultimately, he decided it was best to try his luck on the second floor. There was another set of stairs on the east side of the level. Maybe they would not be blocked, he hoped. Wells walked out onto the second floor of the hospital. He found more bodies, all of them savagely torn to pieces. He even found a few dead police officers and hospital security guards that rushed upstairs. They had run headlong into something they weren't prepared for. Wells turned when he caught out of the corner of his eye, someone charged at him. Wells recognized Fred Douglas, an x-ray technician he had shared a few lunches with over the years working together. He was a nice man, as big a football fan as Wells had ever known. He had a wife and three kids, two of whom he was putting through college. Despite this knowledge, none of it stopped Wells as he swung his golf club across Fred's face the moment he saw the murderous rage in his eyes. Fred flew over the table as he crashed onto the floor but quickly sprung back to his feet, despite the deep gash in the right side of his face. The two men fell to the floor with Fred on top of Wells. Wells used his golf club to keep Fred from ripping into his throat as the man savagely snapped at him with his teeth. Help me! Someone help me! Wells screamed. He felt his strength start to waver as his friend was about to sink his teeth into his throat. Blood splashed on Wells' face as he realized something was thrust into the back of Fred's skull pushing Fred off him once his body went limp. Wells saw a woman holding a mop handle, which she'd broke to create a makeshift spear. Come on, take my hand, we haven't much time, the woman said as she held out her hand for Wells to take. He did, without question, as she helped him back to his feet. He realized he knew five other people with her, a doctor and a nurse from the fifth floor, and two civilians, most likely visitors or hospital employees. More of the crazed infected came rushing around the corner. Run! the woman said. The group turned and ran in the opposite direction as quickly as they could. However, it was difficult getting around all the overturned tables, medical supplies, and hospital beds, all of which had been purposefully moved into the middle of the halls. Wells realized the girl that was saving him was trying to lead the group to the far stairwell. He quickly realized that they were not going to make it. Wait! This way! 
Wells called out. The group didn't argue as they stopped in their tracks and ran after Wells, who dashed into a part of the hospital where they stored blood and plasma. The infected were right behind them when Wells grabbed hold of the door handle that led into the freezer. He pulled the door open and urged everyone to run inside before he followed and quickly slammed the door just as the infected reached him. The infected began bashing at the door, and for a moment, Wells wondered if they knew how to open it. However, after the first three minutes, everyone began to calm down. When they realized they did not understand how to open the freezer, Wells carefully made sure the door was secure before turning to the group of survivors who had found him. One of them seemed severely injured, and the rest were afraid out of their minds. Already, they were beginning to shiver. It's going to be cold, but at least I don't think those things know how to get in here. Wells said. I hope so, the woman that saved him said. You have any idea how to get out of here? The hospital, I mean? She asked. At the moment, I think it's our best bet to stay where we are. I managed to call 911 before I left my office. Hopefully, there's already an army of cops outside, ready to storm the hospital. If we stay in here and wait for rescue, I think we should be okay. Wells tried to sound as reassuring as he could. He wasn't sure he believed himself, but it was the best idea anyone had come up with. At least... It was a hell of a lot better in the freezer than out there trying to avoid the beast, he thought to himself. Until then, Wells looked over to his fellow doctor. Amber, let us help this man with his injuries. Everyone else, look around and try and find if there's anything we can use to stay warm. The woman that saved Wells grabbed his arm to pull his attention towards her. That was quick thinking on your part to come in here, even if it's cold as hell. It isn't a problem. Besides, it is I who should be thanking you, Miss... Rachel's fine. Thank you, Rachel. Do you have any idea what's going on here? Rachel asked. I don't. I'm sorry to say. I was visiting a friend on the third floor. He was supposed to be dying from cancer and could barely walk as it was. No less attack me as he did. I didn't know what to do. A couple of the nurses pulled him off me, but the look in his eyes as he turned and attacked them. It wasn't human. Well said, finishing Rachel's sentence. You shouldn't think about it. You might be in here for a little while. Please help the others. Sure. And thanks again, Doctor. Noah Wells. A pleasure to meet you.